I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Oh, there was a space race. Roman Titov of Russia returns to Earth. We knew what the Soviets were doing. Uh, they launched Sputnik before we put a satellite in orbit. There was a panic mode. The biggest challenge was to escape gravity, and that, uh, as we understood, took the biggest engine ever. You got three guys riding this thing, and you, you got to make sure it's going to work. 30 seconds and counting. There are people sleeping on the hoods of cars, in the trunks of cars, on the ground, everywhere. It's just people everywhere. T minus 15 seconds. We knew it was history. We knew it was history in the making. Five, four, three, two, one. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. As World War II ended, first you duck, and the Cold War then heated up, you cover. so did the race to space. The potential to send Americans to the moon attracted thousands of young engineers from around the country, including from the University of Tennessee. Well, I was born and raised in Tennessee and I went to Knoxville educated there at the University of Tennessee, got my engineering degree, and then came to Huntsville. Signed on as a test engineer uh, under the Von Braun arrangement. German scientist Werner Von Braun was one of the world's leading rocket scientists and a pioneer in the American race to the moon. And von Braun had a real talent for working with people and, and understanding things like that. His team of German scientists led the efforts at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, nearly 200 miles southwest of Knoxville. It's here they built the Saturn V rocket, the vehicle that would propel astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins to the moon. The Saturn V is going to be a technological marvel. It had the most power and uh, it was the most complex in so many ways. The biggest challenge was to escape gravity. And that, uh, as we understood, took the biggest engine ever. While engineers in Huntsville tested every aspect of the rocket on the ground, 49 miles away in Tullahoma, Tennessee, scientists tried to figure out what would happen in the vacuum of space. Well, we're inside the uh, J-4 large rocket development test facility here at AEDC. We simulate how a rocket propulsion system will perform in a, in a higher atmosphere and also in outer space. Today, the J-4 test cell at Arnold Engineering Development Complex is quiet. But 50 years ago, it hummed with round-the-clock testing of the entire Apollo system. Testing was, was very new. I mean, AEDC was basically a teenager, and so we were still learning how to test. Um, a lot of the, the uh, people who were doing the testing were kind of like myself. They were very young. And so uh, everybody was learning at the same time. Dr. Bill Baker is the base's test operations technical director. But when he showed up in 1964, he was just a junior engineer. I was so afraid that the space program was going to be over, but before I got out of school, I went to school year round. Well, the very first test that uh, I uh, worked on when I was here was basically measuring the dynamic stability of the um, escape module. They said that if the, if the rocket were to malfunction, it would be to have the energy equivalency of a small atomic bomb. So you got three guys riding this thing, and you, you got to make sure it's going to work. So an extensive amount of testing had to be done to validate that the engines would operate. But the end of the decade was quickly approaching. NASA pushed for what's called an all-up approach to speed up the process. What NASA says is we don't have time for that. What we need to do is we need to test everything at one time. And Apollo 4 in November of 1967 was that test the entire Saturn V launch vehicle that had never been launched before. And it was flawless. So it really showed them that they were on the right track. All of a sudden, it just lights a fire under you, literally. 
the Apollo 4 mission was unmanned, and so was Apollo 6, but it was riddled with issues. There were all types of problems. You had pogo in the first stage, which is a vibration basically through the entire vehicle. Two engines on the second stage had basically had to shut down. And the next launch of the Saturn V would send human beings to the moon. Now that took a lot of bravery. The crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. On Christmas Eve 1968, Apollo 8 sent men around the moon for the first time. God created the heaven and the earth. It was hailed as a pivotal win for a space program facing budget woes and public scrutiny. And God bless all of you. All of you on the good earth. It proved the U.S. was capable of what was considered science fiction a few years earlier. We were confident of the launch vehicles. We were confident of all the things. But, you know, then the, the one unknown was uh, we were going to land a man on the moon. And that had never been done. So that's uh, where, you know, you, that's where the pucker string gets a little tight. On the morning of July 16, 1969, thousands of cars lined the roads and beaches near Kennedy Space Center in Florida, hoping to catch a glimpse of history. There are people sleeping on the hoods of cars, in the trunks of cars, on the ground, everywhere. It's just people everywhere. At the time, Don Ferguson worked for the Knoxville News Sentinel. He and his family traveled the 704 miles to Cape Canaveral to see the launch in person. You had to watch out people sleeping on the ground in, in the chaise lounges around the pool, everywhere, just people everywhere. So we uh, commandeered chairs and uh, went to the balcony and had a good perch from which to uh, view the uh, blast off. Johnson standing up. Wilson Hoard, another man from East Tennessee who represented Union Carbide in Oak Ridge, was among the thousands in Florida for the launch, but he got a seat in the coveted VIP bleachers alongside celebrities and politicians. I was busy with a small camera uh, that just made um, individual shots. I was clicking that camera as fast as it would take them. Five, four, three. When you get in that countdown mode, one, you celebrate two, once they get to orbit. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. It was a loud cheer when it went off. Shortly thereafter, just seconds, <laughs> and we felt the balcony shake. I won't forget, even at my age now. 92. Oh, you watch everything and you know that here's the culmination of everything you've worked on. You see it happen and that was a, 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 a fabulous moment. I've covered several things. I've had several good interviews over the years. This was by far the most uh, historic thing that uh, I've ever been involved in. Okay, Houston, uh, Apollo 11, and that is the magnificent ride. With 200,000 miles ahead of them, the three astronauts were on their way to the moon. When they got there, they'd need a tool designed by a man in Lenora City. 